main phase. The Burning Cavern. Is it worth your time? In this video, I'll at least be taking some of my time to show off new footage covering a recent improvement in MAME, while also providing my own opinions with a mini review of the game in question. Now, if I was looking to make a popular video, this is probably where I cover Phil's Konami 3D work in a standalone video, or maybe even do some proper non livestream coverage of the sound fixes that were made to the Destroyer from Jail. That's not what this place is about though, I like to demonstrate fixes made to games most people are never ever going to want to play, the others I might revisit later. A few weeks ago AJR Hacker submitted a fix that added the missing sampled sound generated by an OKI MSM5205 to MAME's emulation of the Magnet System, a Spanish system from SIDAR and EFOSA, Electronica Functional Operativa, located in Barcelona. The Magnet System is a somewhat infamous system and one I worked on the emulation of a few years back, although the emulation was never fully completed. I'd hit a brick wall in trying to solve the remaining issues, some of which I couldn't even rule out being down to bad dumps. The game I'm showing is the one that perhaps best demonstrates the improvements that have been made, and is coincidentally also the best of the games on the system, although the rest of the titles do not set a high bar. The system is known for a handful of original games, one being The Burning Cavern, which is the subject of this video and is the game you can see running right now. The system was also home to many really bad, sometimes outright broken ports of more popular arcade games, presumably without a license as no original manufacturer details are shown on any of them. The attempted port of Sega's Time Scanner, for example, is offensively bad compared to the original, the physics are a joke, and you can softlock the game just using the tilt function. I've picked the Burning Cavern here for coverage, as it makes heavy use of the MSN 5205 sampled sound, as speech, spot effects and rhythm for the background music all being generated by the chip. It's also the most improved of the games with the new sound hookup. For the recording of this video I've increased the volume level of the 5205 output so that you can hear it more clearly, and also because I feel the default mixing level is a bit too low. If you are wondering why the magnet system is called the magnet system, it's because the games came on magnetic media, more specifically floppy disks, three and a half inch ones. Just to be awkward, the disks are custom formatted with non-standard track numbering, and to squeeze in more data the system also uses a non-standard clock for the drive speed. This makes them incredibly unreliable and more difficult to dump than they should be. To make matters worse, most of the games on the system load during gameplay, and all of them save settings and scores to the disc, increasing the risk of them getting damaged if the power were to go out. This also means it can be impossible to know what the default scores were meant to be, as the games don't really provide a way to reset them. The system was released, mostly to Spanish arcades in 1987, and it's unclear how much of the promised software was actually developed. Games like Double Dragon and Pac Mania were heavily featured in the advertising for the platform, but no trace of them has ever been seen. I doubt the system lasted too long in any arcade due to the overall low quality of the software, so we're talking discs that probably haven't seen use in over 30 years, and that few would have even valued at the time. In terms of preservation, that puts any remaining magnet system software on the critically in danger list, including the known to exist original title Paris Dakar, where so far we've only found already broken beyond repair floppies. Even for games that are already dumped, it's important to have them dumped from second sources also, as we've already seen bit errors on some of the discs that were giving seemingly otherwise reliable reads, suggesting that the media is decaying. One piece of trivia I find quite amusing here is that the advertising material for the system had to explicitly tell operators to keep magnets away from the floppy disks. Maybe calling it the magnet system was not the best idea. In terms of the hardware, the system uses a quite ridiculous five Zilog Z80 processors, each clocked at 4 MHz. This may sound like a fair bit of power under the hood until you understand more about the design of the system. There's a main board, driving the game logic and loading everything from the floppy disks. That's where one of the Z80s can be found. Then there's the sprite board, another Z80 is there, a pair of identical background boards, each with its own Z80, and the soundboard, again with another one of the Z80s. The main issue is that for each of those Z80 driven video boards, there are no hardware sprites or hardware tiles, only minor acceleration of basic drawing operations. The Z80s are effectively having to manage a frame buffer in software, leaving them with little time to do anything else. MAME doesn't quite fully represent how bad this setup really is, some of the games have severe flicker on real hardware because the sprite Z80 simply can't keep up. Port of Exodus is a prime example of this. 
This video is however about a sound fix, so it makes more sense to talk about the soundboard. The soundboard is quite similar in concept to the ZSU sound control unit, which is actually part of the Z Pinball hardware, another EFO SA product, so maybe it shouldn't be too surprising that elements of the design were recycled. There's the Z80, as already mentioned, there's also a pair of Z80 CTC peripheral chips, basically four channel timers, two AY8910S's for the melody and sound effect, and the MSN5205 for the sample playback. There are also FIFOs and a whole bunch of other glue logic making this all work. Unlike the ZSU, the Magnet System soundboard stores its program in RAM rather than in ROM, because in this case everything has to be loaded from the floppy disk. My own attempts to emulate this board got it to a state where the AY8910s were hooked up and capable of outputting sound, but the hookups for the Z80 CTCs and MSM5205 were completely wrong and no sampled sounds were played. It's a surprisingly complex setup, but thankfully while there are no schematics for the magnet board, schematics do exist for the ZSU boards from the pinball machines, and AGR Hacker was able to use those to fix the incorrect hookup. This is another case of the work done for less traditional main targets, in this case the soundboard for a pinball machine, benefiting the emulation of regular video games. As I was not directly involved with improving the emulation here, I don't have any deeper technical insight into this one, my main interest comes from the work I did on this driver in the past. It's always good to see somebody step in and lend a hand in fixing problems that I was unable to overcome at the time. I suppose therefore I should talk a little more about the game instead, and get on with this mini review I promised. I did say that this was the best of the Magnet System titles, and that the improved sound emulation does add a lot to it, but is it worth your time playing it? If you've been watching the footage rather than just listening to my voice, you'll have seen that it's a flip screen platform game. It consists of 11 challenging screens and then it loops. I'm not sure if it gets more difficult with each loop, many of these magnet system games, including this one, have a dynamic auto level of difficulty that can be enabled in service mode, and here that is the default in the floppy image used by MAME. When I say challenging screens, I mean you'll probably die many times while learning what each one requires. This is one of those games where everything seems to want to kill you, including gravity, because yes, there is fall damage. No background story is provided, you're landing on a planet for an unknown reason, maybe you decided to take a joyride through the solar system, maybe you're on a mission to discover new worlds. Either way, once you're landed, your co-pilot steps out of the ship ahead of you, is captured by a bunch of pink birds and carried off into this burning cavern. It is up to you to go and rescue her, luckily you brought along your laser pistol and a bunch of climbing rope. The graphical style reminds me of 8-bit microcomputer games from back in the day, especially the Spanish ones, but with more colours and detail. I'm thinking something like Roland in the Cave for the CPC. One difference here is that every single screen looks to be hand-drawn, rather than reusing a set of tiles, and this gives it an almost comic book-like look. There's also animation on the background, you can see birds in the distance on the first screen, colour cycling fire on the others, and none of the screens really seem barren, every single one has character. The resolution isn't the best at 248 by 192 pixels, again reminding me of some of the 8-bit computers, but I dare say I like the visuals for the most part. The problem with the style however is it does little to help the gameplay, with the artistic representation of platforms belying just how much smaller some of the collision boxes truly are. You really have to learn where you can and can't stand. Enemy movements and spawning also seem to be incredibly RNG heavy. Often you'll think you've cleared a screen only to have an enemy spawn in the most inconvenient of places. The controls will take a bit of getting used to too. From a standstill, the game appears to prioritise reading your directional controls over jump, so hitting a direction and jump button while already at the edge of a platform will see you plunge to your doom as you attempt to take a step forward before the jump registers. It's a three button game, you have your jump button, your shoot button and a rope button, the third of those being used on several screens in which you have to fire climbing ropes onto hooks that have been placed in specific locations on that screen. These have to be fired from close to pixel perfect locations before they will stick, and it isn't always obvious where to fire them from, again this is something you must learn by trial and error. There's also a scene with bounding, fire-breathing dragons, and on that screen there is a torch. It looks like it's in the background, but it isn't. It kills you, and must be shot to extinguish it. Shooting it darkens the room, allowing you to pass, at least until it reignites a few seconds later. This same scene is also infuriating until you realise you can jump over the dragons when they're not moving. The jump control also takes a bit of getting used to, the longer you hold down the jump button the further you will jump, and this is important otherwise you will be plunging to your death many times. 
the screen with the monster guarding the woman you're rescuing, again it's not clear until you've lost a few lives. Shooting the monster only pushes it back, you can't lure it into the flaming pit, instead you must run head on towards it while firing and it jumps over you. The number of lives I wasted the first time trying to figure this out was absurd. One of the more challenging screens in the game is a rope climb immediately after the rescue, and on this screen, unless you also complete the screen directly after it, you're sent back to the bottom of the rope on the previous screen. This is at odds with every other screen in the game, where if you die, you restart on the same screen. It's gloriously inconsistent. Even right from the start, you must land your ship. If you crash it, you're down alive without even having set foot on the planet. Luckily, on the first loop it does spawn you on the ground after that, but subsequent loops you must land or the sequence will be repeated. Again, only consistent in its inconsistency. The game also has some interesting quirks, such as your bullets freezing in the air whenever you're on a rope. Enemies can still collide with them to despawn them, but the bullets won't move of their own accord until you jump off the rope. That kind of bug to me suggests either a cheap workaround for an even worse issue, or maybe just that this needed a bit more time in development. It could also be a dump issue, but I feel for this kind of problem that is unlikely. None of what I've just said could really be considered high praise, some of it might even be damning. Had I seen this game in the arcades and watched it eat through my money with cheap deaths while I learned each of the screens, I would have probably hated it in the same way that I hate Dragon's Lair. But to its credit, and unlike Dragon's Lair, there is some substance of a game here, and under emulation it becomes surprisingly addictive. It's a short game, a perfect run of those 11 screens would not take long at all, and that means it's a game you almost want to master. It's a game that no matter how many times I've played it and wanted to swear at the screen, I feel I could probably do a one credit clear of, look permitting. That's maybe where I could see this game gaining something of a cult following if it gets noticed enough, one that you could speedrun against your friends. It wouldn't be the first time something like that has happened, you've only got to look at the following Bongo has in certain circles, and that itself is a slightly awkward flip screen platform game. As this video is looking at the sound improvements, I should note that while the background accompaniment is nothing memorable, it does create the feeling of adventure and danger needed. Unfortunately it stops and restarts between screens and deaths, so if there's more to the tune than the first 15 seconds, you're unlikely to hear it. The sound does get switched up on the rescue screen to create a greater feeling of danger and tension, which is a nice touch. Your gun has a satisfying pew pew to it, and the newly emulated sampled speech provides you with plenty of death screams, which you'll be hearing frequently, words of encouragement, and should you crash your ship, a mighty boom. The spooky trees at the top of the rope climb after the rescue scene also laugh at you menacingly. Overall, for what it is, I don't think the sound is too bad here. It fits the animated B-movie vibe this whole game has, and with the recent improvements, does sound much better. For all the punishing game design elements previously discussed, the game does have a few generous elements. You do have limited ammo in the form of what looks like a battery meter, which also acts as fuel for your ship, and this depletes fairly slowly as you use your gun. There are pickups scattered throughout each stage to replenish this, many requiring extra work and some risky jumping or roping to get to. The meter is, however, fully restocked on death, so unless you're looking to loot the game multiple times on a single credit, you can mostly ignore the pickups. That is, aside from the two you must pick up during the escape sequence, because they trigger the final rope to appear, which is completely logical, but that's just how it is. Objectively, I can't say this is a good game, it's flawed, it's frustrating, very frustrating, and in places the programming is questionable, but I will say there's fun to be had here, if you approach it from a certain angle. If you put yourself in the mindset whereby you're playing a budget game for one of the 8-bit computers, the game works on that level, and I find myself spending far more time than I expected playing the game, both before and after recording the footage you're seeing here. Is this a case of so bad it's good? I really don't know, it just kind of works in a certain way. So is The Burning Cavern by EFO worth your time? I would say yes. Once main 0.234 hits with the sound fix, I'd recommend giving it a look, as long as you know what you're letting yourself in for. And that really concludes my look at this bug fix and mini review of the game. If you'd like to see more content in this format, or even just reviews of some games without the bug fix element, let me know in the comments below. Other than that, I'd like to thank you for watching, wish you a good remainder of your day, and hopefully I'll see you on the next one.
¿Jugamos otra vez? Ganadores E, F, O E, F, O E, F, O